to do a quick a round of introductions and then we will get into uh, the panel. But one thing that I, uh, I thought I should do first is actually just take this opportunity to introduce us as an organisation. Um, we're going to do that within about 60 seconds and I've invited Jackie who is our Managing Director um, and who is also based in the UK so it's extremely early in the morning there at the moment. Um, just to uh, say hello to all of you and just give you about 60 seconds on leadership through data. So Jackie. Your show, Brilliant. your floor. Thanks, Carl. No pressure, 60 minutes. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, so we're really excited about this discussion um, and uh, really grateful for the amazing turnout and for all the panellists. So thank you for very much for joining. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Stockwell. I'm the MD at Leadership Through Data. Um, I founded the company four years in the UK um, and based coming from records management, information, um, governance background myself. I'd... Um, attended several training courses uh, within the industry to try and, um, you know, upskill myself. And within that, I found that the training, we do such a hugely important topic and I'm so passionate about our industry and going, attending training courses for me, I found it, I didn't learn and I didn't absorb enough information um, or I learned so much information that I kind of walked away um, feeling like an empty box, kind of what do I do now? Um, so I then thought I'm really going to look at how people learn, people's learning styles, um, you know, how um, you can use particular teaching methods and fold that into a company. Um, and that's pretty much uh, what, what I did. So LTD, we base ours on the psychology of teaching um, and really excited, exciting that obviously we came to Australia last year, which so we've been running a year as a business, which is even more amazing. Um, our core business is um, information management training, but also we do uh, the Microsoft 365 courses, uh, which has really sort of um, helped us to sort of blend both the uh, information management principles and the technology together. So they're not one of each, they are blended together. Our, all of our courses are built by records managers for records managers, um, specifically for the information management industry. Um, so yeah, Carl, I think that was my 60 seconds. <laughs> Can Good. I just I check didn't want, that I, I got did, the right I didn't, time? I, did, I didn't want to wrap you up, but you know, it was it was coming. Um, <laughs> all right. Thank you, uh, Jackie. You and go. thank you for You're staying well. up. Um, all right. The next thing for us to do is to introduce the panellists. I mean, I think that you probably know most of the people who are on here, if not all of them. Um, but look, left to right on my screen, we'll, we'll start with Rachel. Can, can you just get, can everybody just give about 60 seconds about who you are and what you represent in the industry? Can do. Hey guys, I'm Rachel Greaves. I'm the CEO and co-founder of PowerPoint Systems. Um, I'm a certified records manager and certified auditor, certified in privacy and a certified security manager. And I've been advising and auditing government for maybe 15 years. I've seen probably every kind of information governance disaster. Um, when I was still consulting, I was known in some circles as grievous bodily harm. The last government project I dismounted with an audit was worth about $2.7 billion. All that's to say I knew we could do better and we had to do better. So I designed a new kind of AI, uh, Castle Point, it's called a data castle. So we register every system in a whole environment on prem and cloud, um, every record from structured or unstructured systems and every single file. And we read all the content of those and we automatically classify and sentence them for retention rules and against risk and value ontologies. We do that in manage in place and it's invisible to general users. Um, we've got a pretty large range of clients, including Commonwealth Treasury, CSIRO, NBN Co, AFMA, AFSA, APRA, or DESI. Uh, we're in 10 of the 15 FedGov portfolios and of course we've got a large number of state and local Gov clients as well as critical industry and regulators in Australia and overseas. Thank you Rachel. Um, all right next up Alyssa. Hi everyone, it's really lovely to lovely to be here, and and thanks to Leadership Through Data for inviting uh, inviting me to come along and have a chat about this today. Uh, so I work for a company called AppPoint. We're also um, a software vendor. We have primarily focused in the um, Microsoft 365 space. We've been around for more than 20 years now. We're a global organisation, so we're based out of uh, Jersey City in in North America. Uh, we've got about oh, 2,000 employees uh, across the world. What 
what is really good for me anyway is that um, obviously we we make a, a records and information management solution that was actually developed out of Australia, uh, which was really exciting. Um, but now we've taken that we've taken that all over the place. So I'm really, really fortunate in my role is that I get to see organisations globally um, in all different kinds of industries. And so I get to see um, a lot about how different organisations work and some of the different challenges that they have, which I think is, is absolutely fantastic. So my background is very much as a, a, a records manager. So I spent a number of years in the Commonwealth Government. I also spent a number of years in the, the Queensland State Government um, on that. Um, as well. So I actually probably spent more time in government than I have out of it, um, but I'm, I think the scales are sort of starting to tip, starting to tip differently at the, um, at the moment. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm very much looking forward to, to having this discussion. I'm certainly not known for my strong opinions about things, so I'll probably be, you know, quite relaxed as we, as we go through Al Alyssa this. The, so, Alyssa the wallflower, they call you. Yeah, I know, they do. That is, that is my, that's my working nickname, definitely. <laughs> so I think I'll update my LinkedIn profile with that when we finish. So very much Looking forward to having this chat, though. Thanks, Alyssa. All right, Camo. Sorry, Cameron. Uh, well, uh, Cameron or, or Camo, as, as I'm known. Uh, so I'm the Solution Director for Information Governance at Objective Corporation. Uh, we've been around the industry now for in excess of 30 years, publicly listed, um, and effectively sort of initially started off in, in the records or document management, have gone through into information management now, uh, you know, providing enterprise workflow as well on top of that and really just around good governance across the board. Um, I've worked with a whole lot of you uh, for a range of different um, things. Uh, our largest customer is Department of Defence. Uh, but we've also got um, whole of government for Scottish and Welsh governments uh, in the UK as well. So, um, and clearly, you know, we're we're all about just getting uh, the most out of your information asset. Ultimately, that's what uh, we're looking to drive. So that's us. Fantastic. Thanks, Cameron. All right, Andrew Warland. Thank you. Thanks uh, for the introduction. Uh, so most of you may know me. I've had about more than this year marks actually 40 years. It's just gone over 40 years of working with data and information across a range of public and private sectors. I'm one of these people who started out with a completely different uh, job, had nothing to do with what we're talking about, but there was too much curiosity about how we manage data and information. I ended up in this space. My most recent um, employment, full time employment was with Uniting or Uniting Care New South Wales ACT for about seven years where I was the senior data and information enterprise architect, SharePoint administrator, and from 2016, the Microsoft 365 global admin with additional responsibilities for managing the organization's records, both digital and paper records. So it was kind of a wide scope and it was a very busy job. And that's one of the reasons I left there and moved to Melbourne where I thought it would be quiet. And since then, I've just been busy, 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 constantly working with lots of organizations. And I'm currently contracted to an agency, a, Euro a European based agency, more or less full time. So that keeps me busy. Fantastic, and I'm a huge fan of your records about the world blog. And if anybody is trying to figure out Microsoft 365, Andrew's blog is an excellent reference. Um, hey, look, credit where it's due, eh? Um, all right, Cass, you're next up. Hi, folks. I'm Cass Bissett. I'm with Encompass, and I grew up through federal government right when everyone got funded going from card based systems and Excel spreadsheets back in the late 90s um, to going through that whole journey of EDRMS um, to coming out the other end of it now where we're thinking about how do we think about federation? How do we think about strategies to really look across all our systems? and not just focus exclusively on risk. And I think that's one thing that I look forward to talking about today, which a lot of us have struggled with is the stick concept, how we focus on getting people to do the right thing, getting the right outcome. But really we've missed a lot of the data value and the insights and how we serve our stakeholders with information. So a lot of the research that I do um, is into thinking about future trends in technology, but also innovation generally. Do a lot of work with analysts to set at the pace of where we think information management should be going, but also how we think data will be used um, for the long term, and then coming up with plans that mean people don't have to do an all or nothing concept. And I think that's one of the kind of tricky things about this 
call today for any of you who are thinking about joining and for our panelists as well. So we probably feel quite strongly about, you know, what our mission was or the thing we're doing is. But actually we're in an ecosystem and we've got people with lots of different needs. Um, they work in lots of different systems. And so part of my um, challenge is to look at opportunities to um, serve our stakeholders with great data to help our information governance teams work out their transformation plans and to help people get the right funding so that they can get their mission objective met because it's not an easy thing to do when we've got a lot of competing priorities. So I'm very privileged to be able to make recommendations on our roadmap and also on how people think about investing in technology going forward. I'm so pleased to join you today. Fantastic. Thanks, Cass. All right. And last but certainly not least, Abdullah. Thanks, Carl. Hi. Yes, uh, I'm Abdullah. I work, um, I look after the information management and governance portfolio for Microfocus, which used to be um, uh, part of our, the HP software business this, that was acquired a couple of years back. Um, and with it came our one of our flagship products, Content Manager, which was previously known as, and known as Trim. Um, I actually began this phase of my uh, career in a company called Autonomy and, and through acquisitions by chance found my way into, into this world of records. I spent my early days focusing on technology for uh, file-based analytics and data discovery and classification. Didn't know really anything about records until I was introduced through this um, through this acquisition. And interestingly, the more I, I work with uh, in the EDRM space, the more I find myself thrust back into the analytics space again. Um, so huge thanks to Carl and Leadership Through Data for thinking up this panel and, and including me. Thank you to, to all of the panelists and some of whom I do know in person and also have learned from. Um, and thank you to everyone listening in. Fantastic. All right. Well, we are uh, we're fifth. We're sixteen minutes in, and we're only seven minutes behind schedule. So I think we should get on with the questions. Um, all right. We have a we have a series of set questions today. Um, we've got five that we're going to start with, and um, then I've got a whole heap of questions um, that came in from the audience on LinkedIn um, over the last couple of weeks. So if you have a question, um, please post it to the chat. If we get a chance to address it. Um, we will along the way, um, but hopefully we'll get through these sort of five questions quite quickly and we'll have a chance to go a little bit more free form. So the first question is really just some context setting. Um, you know, EDRMS system model, I don't know. So I thought I'd throw it out to the panel to just say, look, when we talk about EDRMS as a model, and that's as opposed to a system, how do you describe it and its value? And we might go back to Rachel again for the first comment. Yeah, sure. Um... So, I mean, every system is an electronic document records management system now, or it should be. <laughs> um, but the EDRMS specifically, I think of it like a, a filing cabinet, like a centralised filing cabinet for digital records, unstructured data, you know, emails and documents, PDFs, that kind of thing. Um, I think that's how it was originally envisioned. But back in the old days of paper files, people used to keep stuff in their drawers on their desk so they didn't have to walk all the way to registry. And then when EDRMS was introduced as the digital record, I think people still preferred to keep their stuff in their home systems once the EDRMS came around. So, um, you know, the, the model has always been to try to get users to centralise data in this um, in this safe and secure and classified repository, which is really, really key. And it's something that is still recommended by the ANIO, for example, every time they do an audit. And if you look at their audits, over the digital era since the 90s. There have been a few that have focused specifically on EDRMS and how it sort of hasn't been working. And actually about 60% of all ANIO audits do call out records management as contributing either to the original issue that, that was problematic in the audit or to obfuscating the issue when they themselves go in and try to review. So and we found the same kind of issue with finance and archives. Um, but in terms of the value, the value of an EDRMS is still there if we can just get the usage. Um, EDRMS, I don't think, will ever capture structured records or Web 2.0 or, or Web 3 very well. It's only ever going to capture a portion of records. And if it's not well set up, it won't capture the context of those records, remembering that the real record is the transaction, not the, you know, not the end state binary file. Um, but if we can capture a portion of that high value or the long term preservation stuff and its context, proportion of enthusiastic users, it does have continuing value. 
And that's why we actually manage quite a few EDRMSs as a system, just like we manage SharePoint or Shared Drives or Google Drive or whatever. So we can enable the business just to keep using it, um, make it more discoverable, link it to other records in context across the business, and of course, automate the sentencing based on the content, which takes a bit of the burden away from users. So for me, the value is still there. Um, we do need a place to put stuff, especially stuff that has long-term preservation requirements. And if we can make it more useful, more discoverable, and more linked to context so that we can also capture the history that's in the structured records that are related, then I think it has a, a long future. Fantastic. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Alyssa, we'll we'll move on to you. Um, and I'm just going left to right across my screen. Um, and look, at about the two minute mark in any of the comments, I'll start to just give you a wind up or something like that, just, just in the interest of time. Sure. I definitely agree with what Rachel said about almost any system be, can be considered an EDRMS at the moment because everything's creating Everything's creating records. Um, I, I make no secret that I don't love the word records because I think that that's pigeonholed us a little bit. And I really, really don't like the term EDRMS um, just because of more historical connotations. So one of the things that I think we haven't done particularly well, myself included here, because we know I've already made all of the mistakes and, and have plenty more to go. Um, uh, one of the things that I would say is what we attempted to do, and, and I'll, I'll, I just speak personally because I don't want to, I want to push my mistakes on everybody else, but some of the things that we attempted to do is when we did transition from a much more physical records environment to a, a, a an EDRMS as we knew it, sort of when it first started to come in, was we tried to implement physical records processes in an electronic environment. Um, and that is really a recipe for disaster. I think we've all found all found challenges, challenges with that. So I and I think that I think language is extraordinarily important ex English teacher so I'll always I'll always advocate for language over everything over everything else but I think our language is really important and if we're talking about the future of EDRMS I'd actually much rather switch the conversation to talk about the future of information management because I believe that information management is just simply the most important thing that an organization does you do not make good decisions without good information that's it that's the bottom line which means the work that all of us do, everybody here in our industry, things like that is critical, critically important to organisations. And if we aren't there leading that strategy and, and taking that charge and helping organisations have the information that they need to be able to do their jobs, then we're not doing things, we're not doing things really well. So I would I would love to drop the whole concept of EDRMS and talk more about how we approach the information management challenge more holistically. I'd love us to drop the word record altogether because I think it pigeonholes us into an end of life discussion when actually it's a it's a life cycle discussion and there's there's so much more that goes into that. So I think it's on all and, of and us. Got, and the next to, question um, we're going to get onto is the future. So yeah, we, we, we might get to continue to this. Our language. And that's my that's my two minute introduction. <laughs> Thank you, Elisa. All right, Kemmer. When you talk about EDRMS as a model, how do you describe it and its value? Oh, and Cameron has frozen. All right, we might come back. We might come back to Cameron. Um, we'll move on to Andrew Warland. Thanks, Kyle. Um, I agree with what uh, very much agree with what Rachel and and uh, Alyssa said. Thank you for those comments. Uh, I see it as a legacy system. In many respects, that concept of an EDRMS is a legacy system built on competing standards to quote James Lappin. If you haven't read his paper, it's a well worth re good read. There were competing standards. We all built different models to manage records. And as a result, we got different ways of approaching it. So there's not one single model for managing records in our so-called EDRMS. I see it as a legacy system, but like uh, Rachel, I agree. There's still some potential value for it to be kept, particularly for long-term permanent records uh, or vital records. There's no reason to get rid of it if you don't have any other way to manage them or put another way those sort of records may be difficult to manage long term in SharePoint or in Microsoft 365, but it does depend on people moving stuff and copying stuff to that centralised location. And that's the bit that concerns me. OK, thank you. All right, Cass, when we talk about EDRMS, how do you describe it and its value? Look, my thinking on this has evolved quite a bit, um, particularly over the last six or so years. 
Um, where I see it adds value is for organisations that have a high degree of scrutiny around a business process or an operational standard that if they don't do it accurately or correctly um, and transparently, they can't seek licences to operate or get products um, certified in market. So often we will see still a lot of value in life sciences and pharmaceuticals driven out of um, EDRMSs that are specifically designed for that marketplace. And I think if any of you saw the updates from Gartner um, over the weekend on this, you know, there there is still very much a, a piece of thinking about, you know, value, value driven um, document and records management. Um, personally, I think anyone who's made an investment in that space, there's nothing wrong with that. And it comes down to organisational priorities and where you're seeking value um, for your organisation. Um, there are legitimate cases to use it and legitimate um, scenarios where it's done excellent work and saved the bacon and all the rest of it. Um, I think, you know, the other piece that we would see it performing, you know, really heavy duty work is around physical information management, where this requires like a deeply um, resourced or deeply feature based um, approach to manage that well and do planning around your estate and so forth, um, offsite management. But for most organisations today, they're less concerned about their physical stores. They're creating far less information in a physical world um, that they're a lot more focused on the other repositories and silos that got created in the organisation. So I think the job of technology here is to say, well, how do you help people transition through this or to meet their transformation objectives without saying, we'll turn that thing off or migrate off that or everything has to be done this one way. It's just not practical. People still use mainframe and domino, for goodness sake. Like, people hang on to things that work because it doesn't meet their priority to turn it off now. But what I see is a lot more focus from a technology perspective on how do we actually grow up through these burdens that we're carrying and all of this tech debt that we've got. We need to find ways that help us rapidly go and find the things that matter, address our risk, and then help us get on with the next priority. Okay, thank you. All right. Last, but again, certainly not least, Abdullah. When we talk about EDRMS as a model, how do you thanks, describe Carl. its value? Thanks, Carl. I think Cameron's after me, so this time I'm not last. Um, I, I may actually, uh, with that question, I may actually disagree with the question in a sense with what we take to be the EDRMS uh, model in the traditional sense. If we think of it as a system of system of registries, I mean, we all know that's how it started, but the model isn't a static one. It never has been evolving, you know, from managing records strictly to uh, incorporating the DMS and then incorporating functional technologies to support the evolution of the digital workplace itself. But this, this model of augmenting a system of registries isn't where I would describe its value fundamentally. Fundamentally, I, I believe that the model is, is a system of metadata or an inventory of entities whose value is, is, a lot, is much more dynamic than just snapshots in time. So a single source of entities, uh, I would say that traditionally has been a single repository of documents um, as well. And, and of course, records management at its core um, was life cycle management, but all of that, the, the aggregations and classifications and so forth, are fundamentally metadata designed for a custodian's uh, view of data. The value this model has brought in the past is precisely in the value of managing this metadata to provide context for future time. And so this context, however, um, the way I say it is dynamic, including what, what I would call the unknown. So, you know, the same health records two years ago are now being interrogated under a pandemic, which happens to be yesterday's unknown context. So, which means the value model itself is evolving as new metadata enters the inquiry process. And this is where I think EDRMS, in order to be more effective, exists in an ecosystem beyond just um, the SharePoint platform. You know, but however, there's a lot of noise around the metadata inventory model because records are being generated much faster and in greater quantity and in diverse formats and systems. And so the value model cannot ignore the need for accessibility and, and findability. It's not just about integrations, but doing so in a manner that that complements um, the other platforms. Right. Thank you. That's all sounding very metaphysical. Um, all right. And well, I think we got I think we got Cameron back. Um, in the last oh, couple of minutes, so, so Camo. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, guys. Mate. Of course, th there's always you know network outages just when we're having webinars. So yeah, thanks for that. 
Uh, so I've, I've reverted to uh, to mobile. Uh, look, I think it's probably already been said, but ultimately, uh, it, it's uh, I think it's about making better decisions. As Alyssa pointed out, if if we're not capturing the stuff in context, uh, being authentic. Uh, and being able to effectively prove that that information is correct, then ultimately we're not keeping the information just on send to our state or national archives um, for history. We're keeping it initially for ourselves to make better ultimate decisions on the things that we've done from the past. So, and that could be in a very short time or, or even a longer time. So, you know, regardless of where that information is, I think that whole EDRMS piece was about having that information asset um, and being uh, effectively being able to go, that is the truth as we know it as an organisation. So I'll, I'll probably just leave it there, Carl, because I know everything would have been sent, um, said previously by our wonderful panellists. Well, you were the only person to talk about the truth. So, you know, I think that's a... <laughs> We, we, we won't go down that rabbit hole. I think we'll be here all day on that one question. Um, look, the, the, the next the next question for the panel is, um, it's really just trying to get a snapshot of what you think the future of EDRMS is. Um, and we might go through the list backwards um, this time. So, Abdullah, we, we might start with you. What, in two minutes or less, what do you think the future of EDRMS is? Okay, so I, I think it's it is what I what I, I mentioned the entity metadata management system is where I think it'll continue to evolve in in the near future. Um, records management itself, perhaps expanding out of the tick in the box or the AKA compliance story to to the wider information governance for the enterprise. Um, so which means a more effective records management process whereby information holders would furnish proactively data clusters to the business instead of you know, the misperception, I guess, of being passive providers of information for legal tasks like FOIs and so forth. So the EDRMS now in some aspects, um, of course, and in the future will need to move in two parallel directions. Firstly, augmenting um, this analytics, privacy risk management, as well as metadata enrichment. Uh, if we go with the inventory model, mapping the unstructured contents of records into a more structured framework. Um, this is where, you know, machine learning and other auto classification pattern extractions, where um, this is where records management is moving or should move, uh, what I would call a vertically. The other direction is more horizontal, which is the EDRMS moving away from centralization as a single source of truth for everything. Uh, this this decentralization does not mean that records management has to be done in situ for everything. Uh, flexibility is, is, is the key because we are addressing more than just the Microsoft 365 world. Thank you. All right, Cass, what have you got to add to that? Where do, where do you think in two minutes or less, where do you think the future of EDRMS lies? Look, I think some of the biggest challenges that EDRMS are uh, kind of lumped with is the manual nature of our expectations. We need users to drive content into the right bucket or the next thing won't happen. And I think that idea, just given the scale of content that people are struggling with, it's just not going to last. And I think this is where a lot of the barriers to success of these programs have been. So my view on this is people will augment those systems and they will be spending more effort to work out how do they sweat their dollar in Salesforce and ServiceNow and M365, and then how do they consolidate away from risk and silos that don't give them high value. So what we would tend to see is there might be hundreds to thousands if you're a big um, portfolio department or if you're in private sector in a bank, you've got thousands of pockets of trouble waiting for you, not one. And the idea that you can get people to do the right thing at scale is just not working. Um, we're just seeing so many risks around that, but also, you know, even inadvertently not taking advantage of data value. So I see people putting less effort and money into EDRMS. I certainly see from a technology landscape perspective, they're looking to their other systems to work out how do we support our staff to get the most value out of these systems. And I think for anyone who is an EDRMS vendor, um, their big 
problem to solve is how do we become, you know, agnostic to ourselves, you know, almost um, how do we then supervise and federate across many different systems? And then how do we generate data that can be trusted, curated through to robotic process automation, data intelligence, predictive modelling, all of these things that people are investing heavily in from a tech stack perspective. And the EDRMS is woefully vacant in that category. It's not doing anything um, and people internationally aren't spending money on it. They're not putting their procurement dollar into buying new EDRMS. So I think it's quite likely that unless um, those technology platform providers can reinvent themselves, it will be something that slides off the hill over time and um, other vendors will attract the attention of how to solve those problems and serve value to the organisation. Thank you, Cass. All right, I'm tempted to change the order here, but I'm not going to. I'm going to go back to Andrew Warland next. Um, Andrew, what do you think? Thanks, Carla. I was interested to hear Abdullah's comments there about uh, the metadata because and the un so-called unstructured information. I've spent the last two weeks going through the structure of XML-based documents, PDF documents, to try and understand all of that embedded metadata that lives with, it's the metadata payload that lives with all of that content that can be exploited by a whole range of different systems. It's not just the metadata that we just use to describe those records, but it's sometimes it's that metadata and it's embedded within the document itself. And so it's quite interesting when you start unpacking those XML-based documents to see just how much structure there is because they are very heavily standards based structured documents. So this idea of adding metadata, I don't know about the future of EDRMS. I think there may be a future for it, but I think it will be in partnership with other tools such as Russell said before, machine learning, artificial or ambient intelligence as Microsoft now call it. So I think that's it's part of multiple systems, I think. OK, thank you. All right, Kama, you're next up. Future of EDRMS so in two minutes. Yeah, so I think it's more, you know, it, it will be part of the information management landscape. Um, there are a range of different tools will be used across the board. There is going to need to be something that effectively has that long term preservation piece, particularly on, on the government side for local, state and federal. Um, but there's also the other challenge in relation to it, which is the, the wider ecosystem. If we've still got our state and uh, national archives still dishing out 900 odd disposal schedules, all with different trigger points. But we've still got to align to that to some some state or some way. Um, I, was, I was recently talking with Queensland State Archives uh, earlier last, uh, later last year. They're effectively having a look at whether there's a, a capabilities to sort of go down the lines of having a short, medium and long term and retain disposal schedule. Now, clearly there's going to be a challenge in relation to the trigger points because I think the triggers are the most, uh, the, the biggest issue in relation to it. So 75 years for date of birth, that means that ultimately that information needs to be kept somewhere in relation to that. So I think it's going to be, you know, that long-term piece will be part of that fabric uh, across your organisation along with the other bits. So, but I think the federation piece, uh, uh, to your point, Cass, I absolutely agree. It is going to be a federation of content. So the EDRMS suppliers or that information management suppliers are going to need to bring those capabilities directly into um, th that piece so that we can federate across different environments, line of business systems, you know, Confluence, Salesforce, uh, and even M365 as well. All right, thank you. All right, Alyssa, future of EDRMS, two minutes or less. Um, so I don't, I don't necessarily think I need to add anything else to the technology discussion, except to say that I agree with with what everybody has said. And I think to just to sum it up in a couple of words is that we can't do what we've always been doing. We need to automate. That's it. There's too much. There's too much volume out there, and if we don't use technology to automate, we're never going to. We're never going to sort of get our, be able to wrap our arms around it. So that's my that's my 15 second thing about that. If we're talking about, if we're talking about future of information management, because I've apparently stood on the soapbox of refusing to say EDRMS in this panel, um, but if we're talking about the future of information management, then I think we need to start talking about our own personal responsibility in that. And I'll, I'll absolutely echo something that Cameron just said, and and without wanting to appear too much of a weirdo or any more of a weirdo than I already do, amen, brother, if we've still got 
these, if we've still got these requirements or these standards that were designed 25, 30 years ago that we're trying to implement in 2022, what are we doing with ourselves? So the, so the actual, I, I think the future is on us but it's on us to recognise what the future is and change accordingly. We don't use rotary telephones anymore because we have something better. We have smartphones. Very few people have analogue watches. And look, good for you if you do, but you're, you, you know, you're carrying around this enormous um, pocket of, of data and information and, and things like that just, just in your phone. It is up to us to recognise that we can't do things. The future of information management is reliant on us to recognise that we cannot do things the way we always did and we have to change. Technology and all of that aside, and yes, yes, I work for a technology vendor, we, we need to change too. We need to keep up with all of this. But if we as practitioners don't change our expectations and, and the way that we've approached things, we are going to do ourselves out of a job and we are too important for that to happen. And I'll step up my soapbox now for a moment, but only a uh, small look, yeah, I, 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 No, I, I think if you just stood around and repeated too important to let that happen over and over and over again, I think that would be a, a worthy uh, set of comments. All right, Rachel, doing things differently um, in two minutes or less. Value of EDRMS? I mean, future. does EDRMS have a future? Yeah, I mean, it does, even if the future is only tomorrow or next month or two years from now. I mean, we... We've probably replaced or are replacing the traditional EDRMS in maybe up to half of our clients, particularly in FedGov. We replace EDRMS that have been in place for five years and have literally never been used. Um, it's it's really hard to decommission these systems, even if they're like actually not being used at all. So whatever is there is going to stay there. And if we can get value out of it, you know, sunk cost fallacy aside, then we should. Um, but I mean, for the for the organisations who want to keep their EDRMS, which if they can get the licensing down to a manageable level by reducing it just to the people who are the enthusiastic users, then all the better, right? It's already got data in it. It's got metadata in it in terms of the processing of records. It's important to keep as well and has context. And it usually has capability for physical records, which most other systems don't, and for long-term preservation too. So for those ones, we just, we just federate across them, as mentioned. So, I mean, our model has always been that there are new systems all the time. And in large organisations, there are thousands of systems. There are also thousands of rules, and we need a way to manage all of that. We can't do it by having agents or connectors for each single system. We can't have a solution for each system, right? We have one solution for every system. So we can read all of that stuff and we can automate and invisibly apply all of those rules, those thousands of records, just disposable schedule rules, as mentioned. And you've got to be careful about how you do it, do it, right? So um, when we looked at how could we automatically apply all of these rules to all of those systems, there's technical ways that we need to be smart about that. And there's also um, smart AI. So we don't use supervised machine learning or rules engines or files, file plants just because they're, they actually just transfer the burden from users of selecting metadata and filing in appropriate locations back to the governance teams. Um, rules as code, I think, is the future of this. It's the international best practice for applying legislation in tech systems, and that's what we use. So I think the future is 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 now. Like, we, we have them, they exist, and they'll continue to exist. We need to make them more discoverable. We need to make the classification in them invisible and automated per the new ISO standard, and we need to just get the best value out of them that we can for as long as it takes to find a new solution for paper files and long-term risk. All right, thank you, Rachel. Um, all right, the next question really is, it's the strengths and weaknesses of the EDRMS model, what they are and what they have been, which is really about where it's performed well and where it's performed badly. And the reason for this is that, I mean, every single person, whether you've been a fan of the, the EDRMS model or not, has remarked at areas that it's strong. And I, I think it's important to remember those. So I, I, I thought that, We'd we'd start with the one person who isn't aligned to a vendor on the uh, on on the panel for this one. So Andrew Warland, core strengths and weaknesses of the EDRMS model. You what do you think they are and have been? Thanks for putting <laughs> me on the spot there. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I, I agree with you. Look, it's been a great system for. Um, <clears throat> in a sense, I see the EDRMS as being a little bit like a, a any asset management system. You know, you work in big organisations where they've got asset management systems and they've got to track the assets. And from that point of view, it's great. 
But the problem is I found that with most DDRMS systems is that they don't capture all the types and volume of all the records. So the biggest bit that seems to be missing is the email. Every time I talk to organization, it's like, well, we capture a lot of stuff in EDRMS, but we don't normally capture a lot of the emails because that relies on end users to put them in the system. And the fact that they don't put them in the system means we don't capture everything. So the problem, and the other, the other problem with EDRMS is in my head, is that they tend to store copies of records that remain where they were created or stored in the first place, whether it's in the email system or on network file shares. Yes, it's great. Once we put them in EDRMS, we lock them down and we make sure they're records. But their original versions still remain lurking around in network drives and in people's emails and all sorts of other places. And how many versions are there? So knowing which one is the actual real record can be sometimes quite tricky, particularly if you're subject to any discovery and you have to produce the final actual current version of the record. It might not be the one in the EDRMS. It could be the one attached to someone's email that was updated after it was assigned to the EDRMS. So that to me is a weakness that it doesn't can't store all the records. And don't get me started on can we store Teams chats in, in Trim? Because <laughs> that's another interesting discussion. All right. Thank you. All right, Cass, we might we might come back to you next. <laughs> Core strengths and weaknesses of the EDRMS model. Look, I think a bunch of the problems that I see with the model itself um, is just the highly structured nature of it and how invisible actual information or value is that's tucked somewhere in that file plan. Um, I think moreover, people want to ask a question and find an answer now and then look horizontally across all their systems and work out here's the 2000 things I need to pull together that I didn't even know were necessarily out there because I hadn't planned for this business event. And I think the uncertainty of business today, um, with, with, no matter what sector we're in, um, is absolutely a case that we all have to plan for. And how do you plan for something you don't know could eventuate or could happen? And um, what I find really tricky about the traditional um, EDRMS model is it's very structured. It's function, activity, transaction based, things go in the cubby hole. And if you need to find them, you're relying on keywords. None of that, you know, nice metadata is, you know, even dependable most of the time because people have keyed it in and maybe picked the A option or gone click, click, whatever was not mandatory and moved on to get their thing in the bucket fast. And this really creates a big problem for us when we start to think about how do we see um, problems? How do we spot when we spoke about this or where we made a decision around that or every time that we knew about a topic with a Royal Commission? That's not logically there for us and the answers are really missing in EDRMS today. And I think the modelling that we have to do going forward is to really think about how do we farm knowledge? How do we come um, with insights today to meet the need of the business right at this moment? without having to ask people to go back and leaf through things manually. I think a lot of that is a foundation trap, you know, with a traditional EDRMS is that if you haven't highly organised everything and let's face it, it works really well for smaller organisations that do a thing. Um, that they're not portfolio and policy making agencies, they're not doing service delivery, and they can get really good value out of it um, because it gives them an organised backbone that you can depend on, you know where to look, you can go into that um, folder or file and get your answer. But I think as business has gotten more complex, more diverse and is highly evolved now, um, people buy a system on a credit card and start using it. The data and information is going into many different places that the records team isn't even aware about. And I think that's the biggest challenge when you think about adding value to your organisation. If all you've got is one system, one trap door, you know, at your disposal, it's really not enough. It's not dealing with this um, challenge of how people are thinking about privacy horizontally, how we think about security risk, how we think about data value and all of the transactions that come together. So I, I feel like it's a real burden for people to meet their information obligations and something that they have to plan to solve. Okay, thank you. All right, Abdallah, strengths and weaknesses of the EDRMS model. Yeah, I think everyone's pretty much covered it um, so far, I agree. Um, you know, the EDRMS, the way we I see it, the point of departure is is more compliance and, and privacy, at least as a model, um, which bodes well for governance teams. Um, but it has fallen short, obviously, when the point of depart departure shifts um, to, to collaboration, to sharing, um, where records management seems to get in the way. 
um, of of that of that particular model. So I think that's where the weaknesses have been seen, where the single, as Andrew mentioned, the single re source repository model um, does not end up being the only source due to subsets of information being stored, which which um, uh, feeds into problems in in getting value. So the digital workplace model was always there for bound to clash with the compliance model of the EDRMS. So I think that's where it's been, um, the way it has performed, performed badly, where it's been um, successful, of course, in, in the traditional uh, understandings of, you know, multi-jurisdiction security and hybrid and comp and retention and all of the core strengths that we knew from the past, where it's also been successful um, now, certainly, is where it's taken the governance uh, platform approach, uh, very similar to um, to M365, as opposed to when compared to SharePoint, the approach of managing under the covers, um, where um, you know our traditional customers, when we are looking at customers moving to the cloud, moving to M365 platform, and expanding more into a service model for line of business applications. They're moving with the EDRMS, not by dumping it, uh, because there is a flexibility um, that and and uh, that uh, to Cass's point that that can be leveraged if leveraged correctly uh, for for value where you're dealing with uh, multiple systems here. Fantastic, thank you. All right, Alyssa, we'll flip we'll flip to you next. Strengths and weaknesses of the EDRMS model. Um, I, know, I know, you know, we've got a whole bunch of vendors here. It would have been much more interesting if we'd all just argued with each other the whole time, but there's just, there's far too much agreement going on, going on here. And I'm not going to help that by disagreeing with what everybody said anyway. So just to sum up really quickly and not take up too much time on this question, the strengths are the fact that we're managing our information. It's obviously a strength. However, it is that we're, we're choosing to do that in the whatever, whatever way. The weaknesses are that we're not keeping up with, um, with how to, how rapidly technology how, how rapidly technology is is changing, um, I don't have I don't have anything more to say on it than that. Okay, fantastic, thank you. All right, Rachel, strengths and weaknesses. So guys, um, you know I'm a I'm a records manager and I I did just fine with EDRMS. I knew where everything was. I could find it. I could use it. I loved it. Um, records managers tend to love it because our brains are wired that way. And also we understand it because we're subject matter experts. We understand the purpose and the point and the value of doing it. Users never really have. And um, we've tried to train them. We've tried to make them sit in four hour you know, training sessions before they can even get a network access. Um, they don't internalize it because it's not important to their role. Um, what is important to their role is being able to find information quickly. And EDRMS, I think the main weakness is that it's sort of turned into the hand that bites us. So, um, so if we think about like um, Vivian Salon, um, who was an Australian citizen who was deported by the Department of Immigration because the staff couldn't find her record in the EDRMS, um, that was a really catastrophic outcome for that individual. And it was because general users in the organisation couldn't discover in that system. Same thing with Cornelia Rao, system not discoverable. Same issue with um, the triple delete crisis for um, missing and murdered Indigenous women in Canada. Uh, systems too hard to discover for general users, so they end up doing the wrong thing with the data. But in all those cases, the EDRMS was the place where all the evidence was that proved the recklessness of the managers in those situations. So, you know, it comes back to bite us because there is enough evidence in there. Records managers can find the evidence when given enough time, but general users who need it to do their job in the moment can't. So that's really been the key for me. It's very strong for records managers. We can use it. We can get the stuff out of it, but general staff can't. And that means we're just, we're retroactively addressing what went wrong rather than preventing things going wrong in the first place. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. And Cameron. Last so bit, I've got like a, Adela, I've, not I've least. Got, yeah, I've got a different view on this. And I, I, I think it's, and maybe it's just from our customer base. So what I've seen is, you know, when when we've had it perform really well, the organisations are looking for transformation. So whether that be digital or just transformation as a whole, they use the EDRMS as a driver. You know, being able to put processes on top of that. So whether that's, you know, we need to automate in some respect, you know, FOI processes or whether it's ministerial processes, you know, we see that you know, really driving a whole range of different um, capabilities across the organisation. 
If an organisation, though, initially goes through and effectively goes, I just want it for compliance, we will see it perform badly because that's all it's ever been bought for and therefore it's going to be this black box in the corner which records managers will use to make sure that they've got their stuff. If we're doing it, though, from a transformational point of view, the things around search that we've talked about and all of those end-user things that make effectively business uh, you know, more efficient and more productive, then that's where it's always going to be successful. And probably to the point, um, Carl, I'll just mention, you know, Paul O'Donoghue and, and Jasmine Wilkins asked questions about when will EDR and, uh, become a quality and value focused service and cease being narrow focused compliance. I think, and, and Jasmine asked, when will EDRM become the knowledge epicenter of the organisation servicing content contextually? I, I think both of those, if we're looking at, at using that as, as a tool for transformation, then both of those things will happen. And, you know, if we now, Alyssa, talk about information management rather than EDRMS, then we're, we're exposing a whole lot of information that is in other systems that they could, that people can come to and provide that context around it. Great comments. Story. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, now the, the next question, um, we, we start to get onto some issues about practice. And we start, and, and I mean, Camo just touched on them, Alyssa's touched on them, everybody really, Rachel as well, everybody's really touched on some of these issues. And so the, the question is, when an EDRMS is ineffective, how much do you think that's down to the system and how much do you think it's down to the practice and the organisation around it? And we might start with Alyssa because I think you made the first comments about practice. <laughs> I could be wrong. Um, okay, so I've, I've said a few things about this. So again, I don't know how much more I have and I don't want to, I don't want to be beating us up because as I, I, I've also said repeatedly, I think we do just such a fundamentally important job. But and, and there's been some comments in the chat, and I'm loving watching the chat, by the way, and thank you so much for ev to everybody for engaging in that because it just makes it such a more a, a much more rich experience, most definitely. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff in the chat about talking about user-centric design, which we've talked about for a really long time now. It's not anything new, but it's it's something we haven't really got right. And and some of the comments that we've had sort of going through that I've I've really enjoyed and had a bit of a snigger at, I, I have to admit, um, is about, you know, we wanted everybody to love records management as much as we do. And oh my goodness, I love records management genuinely. I wouldn't still be doing this job if I wasn't passionately committed to it. I think information is so valuable. More, more, more information in, in you know, for as long as it's required. Um, but um, uh, what we what we have failed to do is is think about outcomes rather than rather than I need this button to be blue or I need this word to say this or I or I need to do this. And there are a majority of vendors on this panel today, and I'm sure every single one of them will agree when we see RF RFPs and RFTs and things like that coming where we've just we there's been cut and paste from. Uh, um, where we've got cut and paste from a, a standard that hasn't been updated in a number of years and things like that. We're not thinking about outcomes. We're not thinking about what our organisation actually needs to achieve or what our, you know, what the end state needs to be. We're thinking about, well, this button should be blue um, uh, rather than what is it that my user actually needs to achieve here. So I think if we switch our focus to, I don't necessarily care about the path that I'm going to go on to get there. I care about being successful in the end. I think that's a, a better way of, of approaching things, definitely. Fantastic, great comment, thank you. Um, all right, Rachel, how much is practice? How much is system? How it's, much is organisation? It's all the system, right? Because every individual wants to practice in their own way and there are thousands of them and one of us. So, you know, the average odds are kind of one record manager to a thousand staff, right? That's that's pretty much how it is. Um, we have to support how people intuitively want to work and people are different. Some people like to structure their stuff really deep. Some people like big buckets of data. Some people like to navigate versus browse versus search. 
Um, and most systems, most effective enterprise global systems support all those paradigms. You know, in SharePoint, you can you can global nav, you can local nav, you can search, you can interact with your data in whatever way you want to as an individual. And if we're not supporting that flexibility with all of our systems, then we're we're gonna we're gonna run up against people who just won't ever be able to adopt it and use it. So um, when we built the EDRMS, and you know, the founder of Trim will tell you this, it was built for records managers. It was never meant to be used by general staff in the business. Um, and trying to get them to use it and change their brains didn't really work. So I think we learned that um, after a long time of really trying to flog that dead horse um, and we stopped trying to make people work in that way and now we have a lot of solutions to kind of make invisible the interface essentially um, which means we have to take away people having to select their own classification from a drop down we have to take away people needing to select metadata as mandatory um, we have to take the records management part away from exposure to general users because we can't actually give them all an experience that they would love to have and want to volunteer into and if we don't give them that then they just will will not do it or they'll do it wrong and that really poisons our compliance so um, and that's why the international standard has now changed again to be automated and invisible. Um, it's really only by taking it away that we can make it effective at all, I think. Great, thank you. All right, Cameron, you seem to be the next logical place to go. Yeah, so uh, to a certain extent, I, I, I partially agree with Rachel, um, you know, uh, but from my point, I believe it's down to organisation and practice. Time and time again, we've seen um, the same software in different organisations run completely differently. One is, you know, back end records management in the corner. Others are transformational in relation to this process. So regardless of whether it's Trim or Objective or any EDRMS, we've seen that. And we've also seen the champions and the drivers work really hard on getting that to where it needs to be. And we've also seen those people, once they move from one organisation to another, all of a sudden, there's a change in both of those organisations, unless it's really strong backfill in relation to that culture, in relation to the transformation side of things. So uh, for me, I, I think it's more about organisation and practice than it is actually the, the underlying software itself. All right, thank you. Uh, Abdullah, when an EDRMS is ineffective, system, practice, organisation, what do you think? Um, yeah, but I think that's obviously there's a bit of both. I do agree with some comments um, and, and obviously disagree with with some um, in terms of um, you know we've already I've already talked about the point of departure for the EDRMS as being compliant. So I do agree that it was that when approached as a management tool, there is a problem, and so and that approach would impact practice. Um, but we do have customers across the spectrum from those that use the system. You know, for example, outside of the M365 world where adoption rate is near perfect to those that have a more hybrid approach of classified data sets or more collaborative ones. This is where an integrated approach is, is gaining uh, adoption. And there's, of course, the other end of the spectrum where we're talking about EDRMS by stealth. But, you know, where it's been ineffective uh, when it comes to not managing disparate systems, like perhaps uh, the new world we're talking about may have been down to the system before, uh, but should not be with how the model um, has evolved or is evolving to to multiple uh, data storage based. Um, even that is not black and white because the EDRMS has always been um, our, um, has also been a records repository for uh, structured systems as well. So I don't know. Um, well, certainly, from our customer's perspective, there's a lot of structured data that's that's uh, also managed and added, analyzed. Of course, the the functionality of the EDRMS has to be extended and augmented beyond um, the traditional uh, model, which is where we op, which is how we operate. Um, but I think where the practice can take a hit is in the mapping of manual or physical processes to the digital world. And and so the EDRMS technology, I think, enabled that much to its detriment. Uh, so where people are now moving away from those practices um, and the question, you know, is everything a record to which I get varying answers? Uh, the EDRMS, if it hasn't in the past, uh, has uh, starting must evolve, if not already started to do so to cater to these changes. Um, we can certainly leverage the best of both worlds in terms of practice and system uh, and move. Um, and I see um, if we identify these practices as a result of a system of um, uh, and revolve into a system of meanings 
based model rather than a registry model. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Abdullah. All right, Andrew Warland. Thanks, Carl. Um, I often, often find, you know, just in the same way as Rachel said, standards have changed, and I find that kind of amusing in a way too. The 4390 to 15489 and the 16175, which is now just about systems as opposed to business, you know, these standards continue to evolve. Also, we need to evolve. I don't know how many times you've had young people come into the organisation and say, email, do you have a chat system? And what do you mean save it somewhere? What do you mean folders? They just save it wherever they want to save it. They don't care about you. They don't care about any system typically. They typically want to sit on their phone and chat with each other using whatever system they can get their hands on. Uh, let's, we need to understand that this is an evolving workplace and there are evolving ways that people want to work and can work. And I think Microsoft, to just use that example, is kind of coming to the challenge by saying, we need to do this differently. There's a different way that people want to work and we need to address that model. So for me, if it's ineffective, it's because it's not keeping up. Um, and I did notice just before this session that um, Microfocus has released an app for Content Manager. I thought that was interesting. So good for you guys to have released an app for Content Manager and I hope it's successful, but uh, it needs to be understood in the context of the change in workplace and the change in the way people want to work and how they want to work in organisations, not what we want and what we expect people to do. All right, thank you. And last but definitely not least, Cass. Hi gang, um, I think <laughs> um, we're in this really kind of tricky spot and I have to say like for the first time in my career, I feel really unsettled at the amount of effort and the burden that information managers and people who have to service information requests are under. Um, I see just this enormous workload. They are working around the clock on weekends. There's none of this idea of government checking out or clocking off. Um, you know, we see some of the hardest workers in the country in these roles. And I think what's really interesting, um, and I reflect on quite a bit with um, Microsoft 365 coming into action in particular, is when I look back on programs that were successful in my early career, people spent an enormous amount on doing consultation with the business, understanding what they do, how they work with information, how to simplify friction in the business, and designing pathways to make that flow. And there, even with all this transformation going on, this seems to be really abandoned in how we work with information, how we service it, and how we actually um, get processes to the end. And the burden is just on work longer, you know, search more systems manually, pull a bucket together to then go and run a search tool over or something like that. And I, I think it's regardless of whether it's an EDRMS or whatever system you're using, um, I think the business has been really neglected in all of this. And so my feeling is it's a combo. It's never one thing. It's people, process and technology that cause problems and call, give us opportunities. And I think with the right lens on what we want to be as an organisation and how we prioritise information as an asset, I did say it. Um, I've loved it for many years. I think information is one of the most powerful things that we have um, at our discretion and it needs to be empowered. But the people that create it and where they work need more direction as well, because it's almost been like a let loose. This idea of stealth and records, I think, is being really negligent to the fact that people do need direction and we need to have a standardised approach of how we support people to do these jobs that they've got to get done every day that really matter. How do we get them better value? How do we put information in front of them so they can make the right decisions? How do we protect it? And that idea of a transaction that Rachel touched on at the beginning, it's not one document, it's countless chats and interactions and reports and processes that go on together that make that collection of a record. And I think regardless of what system you're invested in or thinking about, you have to have that concept in mind and have the business front and centre. How do we help people? How do we help people every day work better, faster, make better decisions and avoid, you know, diving into the pit of doom, which we don't want anyone to be in. Those recovery projects are horrific. I've worked on some shocking ones that I still think about to this day where, you know, people weren't prosecuted, where the wrong thing happened, um, people die. But what we want to be thinking about is the opportunity in front of us. How are we better? How are we stronger from our information? And not just thinking about um, avoiding, you know, issues. It's also the opportunities we're missing with our data. 
And Cass, while you're standing on your soapbox, um, I, I think that I think this might be a really good opportunity to segue neatly into the final question, which is what do you think the key factors are in making records management a future ready and effective discipline? And I think we'll just let you roll on through because I think you are on a bit of a I think you're on a roll there. <laughs> Look, um, I, I really see that records has been kind of pushed off to the left where we have like highly intelligent people with degrees and masters on information not being consulted and pulled forward in a lot of the foundational work that organizations need to think about in this next kind of 10 and 20 years that they're setting themselves up for and i think that's partly to do with tooling if you don't have a way that you can say i can visualize where our risk is i can put my fingertips immediately on this information to help us address this business issue it's really hard Hard to be someone that people come to or to be a trusted system that's going to be used for those jobs. And so partly I think we have to reimagine what this role is going forward and we have to think really cleverly about how do we automate the drudge work how do we get data value generated that people can trust and reuse and support our other systems of decision making and authority? And then how do we really like start tooling up to support the needs of the business? Because often, you know, people just want to get to the right thing. They just need help. And if you're not actively engaged or working um, with different business groups to understand what their needs are of information now, they're going elsewhere. They're on Google. They're finding the thing to swipe and go to get this little sliver of capability. And IT is also on an agenda as well with, you know, leveraging their kind of heavy fat assets. Um, we need to be in a position where we're guiding and coaching um, so that we've got the right foundations to grow from. And I think that's not easy, but, you know, we've got forums like this and a lot of community groups where the attention needs to go on that now. And I don't really care what system people are using. It's how do you get this out? come done and you know how are you thinking about setting yourself up for growth um, because right now it is so fast there is so much change and we're not in the room from a records perspective advising on what should be done we need to open our lens and think think bigger about information fantastic all right Alyssa you know from one soapbox to the next how do you, what do you think the key factors are in making records management a future ready and effective discipline again I, and I do like a soapbox, definitely. Um, um, so I think I think the key is actually for us to be future looking. So to stop to stop the the conversation about well, this is the way that we've always done it, or this is what we've got in place, and and things like that. But also to push ourselves in that. So I don't. I think that there's some personal responsibility. Like I take this on myself as well is is sort of keeping up with you know what actually is changing do i know intimately how these how these system works in the organization do i know intimately how my users need to be able to work things like that um to to be able to constantly be have that future that future looking thing i absolutely agree with cassandra with what she said there is that things are just changing so rapidly look at the change that we went through just in these last two years and yes okay we've had some fairly extraordinary circumstances but we're never going back to pre-covid this is it now this is this is how it is the world has fundamentally changed and we have to fundamentally change with that so if we're not willing to take that personal responsibility to make to make some of those changes be it through you know um self um self i want to say self improvement but that's not the word that i'm looking for but like more as in self learning and and things like that then we're not you know we're not giving ourselves the opportunity to be able to lead our organizations through this so i think the future is us um, I believe the children are our future, but in this case, we are the children. And with that, I will launch into a song to finish it off. Um, no, I've run out of time. What a shame. Next. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rachel, I've never heard your singing voice before, but, you know, maybe you'd like to pick that tune up. You never will. Oh. <laughs> um, okay. Damn. So, so for me, how do we make records management effective and how do we keep it scalable to the future? Number one, we have to link it to risk. You actually can't manage risk without managing records and you can't manage records without understanding risk. And I still feel like cyber and risk are divorced from records management and they need to come back together. Mm -hmm. That's really, really key. Um, also, I think we need to take ownership and control of what the obligations are for the organization so it doesn't get decided for us by 
vendors and get diluted down to be something convenient. Um, we've all seen IT come with solutions saying, oh, we can just do it like this, we can just do it like that. You can't though, and I can explain to you why, but we're coming into that conversation a bit too late. So that's a problem that we all have. Um, but the big thing for me is that we have to minimize efforts that's not scalable, right? So once we start using AI and we know what we have and we know where it is and we know who's doing what to it and we know what risk it has and what value and what rules apply to it and whether they're being breached, there's no more plausible deniability. Like there's no hiding at that point. You have to take action on that risk and treat those spills and destroy those records. Um, so the more we get coverage through automation and AI, the more work there is for records managers to do. So the model of how we're doing it has to be really easy and really repeatable. It can't be us making a file plan for every single folder in the environment to automate the classification. It can't be supervised machine learning where we have to provide 10,000 examples of each rule um, when there are 900 rules per, per RDS. Um, so we just have to make sure that we're taking steps to make sure that once we have that full coverage, we actually have time to do something about it. Otherwise, we're just finding problems that we can't solve. Love all of those comments. Um, Camo, anything to add? Uh, I think you know, Rachel touched on the security side of things and it has absolutely broadened out, you know, particularly on you know, the remote working, there is now a bigger risk on our specific content uh, that we've got for, for people both inside and outside our organisation. So, I really think the security side of things um, really needs to be promoted in relation to that. So I think, you know, it's more of a governance role, which records is part of that. But there's also security and there's also some business analysis work in relation to some of those bits in relation to either integration or ML and AI. So yeah, it's broad. You can go in a whole range of different uh, environments uh, to sort of and specialties in relation to that governance piece. Great, thank you. Um, Abdullah, what would you add or take uh, away? I, I think everyone's pretty much covered it, uh, but you know, the future of EDRMS, I would um, agree with everyone, is to really stop talking about the EDRMS model as such, uh, not go down the path of, uh, of trying to unpack the problem. Um, as I've read so many times in terms of, you know, master data mapping is it the technical architecture of the system, but really in the evolution of the the management model itself. It's not a stagnant legacy tool of, of yesterday that we're talking about. It's continue, it, it is continuously evolving to meet changes um, in, in the workplace. Um, while we can't ignore uh, the, the need to manage the integrity of, of uh, diverse as well as closed down systems um, and, and facilitate the meaning based computing that, that everyone's referring to as well. Um, you know, we develop the next generation of, of the solution uh, with people, processes uh, and technology in mind, but we don't do it in isolation. We have to put it in the context of, of the discovery and, and, and usability problems that, that this panel um, touched upon. Thank you. Andrew Warland. Thanks, Carl. I think you know, the few times I've watched in the in the chat on the side that uh, people saying we stop we need to stop calling them records or call it records management. I think it's broader than that. Um, I really like what Rachel was saying before about the you know making better use of artificial intelligence and machine learning, but not having to train it as such to automate the processes to manage. And I'll use the word with a small R records to manage digital content that could be of value that could be in our older definitions records as such but actually might form, might be bits and pieces of lots of different things that come together. Uh, it's not just everything that's in a single container or aggregation. It could be across the whole organisation, including in Teams chat and where, wherever it might be. I think one of the things that I've learned strongly from being a data and information analyst for a very big organisation was just how little records management fitted into that space. Uh, there was a huge amount of data modeling that we had to do to understand where all the data was across all of our systems and records management was about five to two to five percent of all of that data. So it wasn't big and that worried me, the fact that there was so much more information out there. So I think records managers often say, oh, we don't touch the business systems because, you know, we they're not record, we can't, we don't have access, whatever. You should have access. You should be able to get into that part of things. You should change your, you should start learning new skills 
data analysis is not a hard thing to learn and it's a really useful thing to learn, particularly because of, as I said earlier, the structured nature of all the content that's sitting in systems these days. So the more you get into that space, the more you realize how interesting it is. And then you can become a data analyst that happens to also manage bits and pieces that in the past probably were known as records. We can bring them together however we need to bring them together. All right, that actually brings us to, to the end of the structured set of questions. And I did get everybody, didn't I? I didn't miss everybody on that, anybody on that last question. No, good. Well done, um, Carl. <laughs> thanks, mate. So, you know, I, I think what it gives us an opportunity to do is, is to open up to the audience for um, just some open questions and to go back to the list that we've got. Um, one of the questions that I, I'd like to throw in that's a little bit unscripted, um, everything that you all talked about sounds like hard work with no magic bullets. And this is an open question, so please just jump in. But everything sounds like hard work with no magic bullets. Um, are there shortcuts? Um, yeah. <laughs> so the the way we do this is that we do the hard work. So um, the the real the real trick is from a, a technology point of view is to get the full coverage. That's too hard for internal IT teams to do with customization and configuration. That's not scalable. So we do that work with the tech. And the other hard part is applying the records disposal authorities. That's hard for users if it's left to them. It's hard for records managers if they have to map it all. Um, but it's something that we can scale because we can code those regulations. So when we transfer the work back to the vendors, which is I think where it, where it should be, then we're providing solutions that are immediately useful with immediate return on investment for the business. Not something they have to spend six or eight months building a model or a framework for or training, not something they have to keep monitoring and maintaining and working on themselves all the time. Um, once they've got the coverage and the capability, they need every single warm body with any records management skill to start doing stuff that's important. So finding the stuff that's valuable, making sure it's protected properly, making sure it's disposed of when it should be. Um, I think there is hard work, but we've got to let people do higher order hard work that's more rewarding um, and get them away from drudge work and work that can be done by machines or that can be coded by us as the vendor. So I think that's the solution. And I think that's why um, the, the winds are, are shifting in terms of what organizations expect from their software. I'll probably add just a maybe different lens on what it is that people think is hard about this. And um, I think some of the biggest challenges that people face is they feel like they're in such a mess they don't even know where they'd start and that idea of hard is just the idea of the daunting task of facing all that battleground um, part of the thing that i think is critical for organizations to be able to do is visualize and see and understand where their risk is because it helps you prioritize the problem it, this idea of boiling the ocean and getting every problem fixed up front won't get any business case across the line and it's certainly not helpful to think about how you're going to tackle that but if you can visualize where your highest risk is and go and run that out you can see where your data opportunities are you can actually then just keep evolving a approach program of continual change and continual improvement. And that's what I think, um, you know, is a big difference between how EDRMS was. You built the whole thing and then it was blank. There was nothing in it except for maybe what you migrated in. I think the benefit of taking modern technology approaches um, is to be able to have that answer of what's out there. You know, you turn a platform on, its job, you know, certainly from an Encompass perspective is to discover and understand and show you where to focus and then automate those processes, similar to what Rachel's discussed. But if you can't see what to do or even know where to start, it can be a really big burden um, to think about not just making a business case, but how you G up your team to turn up to work every day with this big wall in front of them. You know, we want to see that innovation. We want to see and benchmark ourselves and our improvement and have the data tell us where to go next. I would add to that as well, Carl, you used the word magic bullet. And I think, you know, what you sort of said, what's the magic bullet? And I think it's important to remember that it's called a magic bullet because it doesn't exist. So 
there is actually work. There is not, you don't just click your fingers one day and go, oh, great, I've solved all of the problems. There is work that goes into this. I think, Cassandra, you you really said this this well, definitely. Um, there isn't a magic bullet. That doesn't exist. There are things that you can do that will make it easier. And I absolutely agree with Rachel um, in, in saying, you know, your system should be making it easier for you. It should be taking you 12 months to implement a, a system and, and things like that. But it, it's work. It's about identifying what it is that I start, what it is that I start first, accepting that not everything's going to be perfect, accepting that it is going to be a process. A magic a magic bullet is just that. It's magic. It does not exist. There is work that goes into this. But that is that is our work. That is what we do. And we make things better for people. So it's valuable work. It's really good work. It's, it's work that is worth doing, but it's still work. A magic bullet doesn't exist. I'll probably just got a <laughs> good cash like that. Um, uh, I, I think there's also, it's not just about the classification of the content, it's actually about using that as an information asset to do other things and processes, to make it, to surface the content to the end users to ultimately make their job easier. So, you know, while I, while I understand that, you know, people want to go, gee, this document is just put in or this record or this piece of content is put into this system and it's automatically put against a disposal schedule and we're ready to go. But I actually look at it and go, how can we use that piece of information? Because we've been told it needs to be kept. But let's use that piece of information to for the betterment of our organisation to actually get some benefits along the way, either productivity or efficiency in, in relation to that piece. So, yeah, I, I think it's about being able to get it, but also about to, to use it as much as you can. Just sweat it. Sweat the asset. There you go. I've said it. Carl, is this an open question? Uh, we can make it an open question if you'd like, Michelle. <laughs> So I just have two cents with Cameron. Uh, yeah, I, I'm so with you. I think, unfortunately, we one of the biggest downsides of EDRMS is that we traditionally have always focused on retention and disposal. And actually, there is no value from the end user's point of view. They really don't give a damn about that stuff. Uh, we've made it super overly complicated. Um, hey, look, we all get that there's legislative requirement. We get that there's some, you know, there's some really good value in retaining some things, but that's been our focus and we've come at it from that perspective. So Cameron, to your point, you know, there's no value in the information unless there's a value in the information for the end user. And so yeah. being able to interrogate your systems and being able to find what you've got using artificial intelligence, using tools that are available to us. Let the users just do what they want to do because they're going to do that anyway. Whether you put any other structures in place or not, they're going to do that stuff. So let them use the tools that they want to. Let them use the applications they want to. And then using AI, using the smart technologies that are out there, even some of the built-in technologies in, in M365 are better than what we've got when we're not doing anything, right? So using some of those things to really show the value of the information for repurposing, making good decisions, and therefore bringing the value to the business and not focusing it on the R&D. We focus way too much on that as records managers and I think it's I think it's um it's counterintuitive for the rest of the organization and I one of the things that I think I'd say about that is that there's never one of the, the big challenge for information in EDRMS for me is that everybody talks about information as an asset that has value but you don't have that it doesn't really have value unless there is a process to make it valuable and I'd love to uh, that is a nice neat segue into Carl Hines question in the chat, which is what services does a future ready records management or information management team provide to their organization? What does that service mix look like to all of you in the future? Uh, so I'll open up. So I think there's, there is clearly going to be some form of uh, regulator uh, side of things to make sure that we're, we're capturing what we should be capturing. Uh, but I also think there's that other side of making sure that that's also available in the places that people are working. So they're going to be responsible for being involved in conversations around what applications are we using? What do we need to service that content through? 
how are people actually working today to make sure that that information is actually getting to the hands of where the people are actually making the decision. Um, I thought also, again, getting back to processes, being involved in those processes that an organisation does on a daily basis and making them more effective. And again, servicing the content where the people are to where the people need to be and get that information. I think the other side too is the security side of things. And, and to that point, whether it be risk um, or, or the R&D side, I think the security model also needs to be managed by uh, that governance group. And I think the other thing that they're going to be concentrating is, is saving money. So now that these are electronic records, they are more than likely going to be in a cloud environment uh, in some way, shape or form. So to actually destroy that content when it needs to be is actually ultimately saving coin uh, for the organisation as well. So there, there's a few sort of different angles that I've taken on that. All right, we have about 60 seconds left. So one final 60 second answer to any question from any of the panellists and then we'll wrap up. Don't all jump in at once. Um, I'll jump in. Um, <laughs> my answer to the same question is that governance is exactly right, Cameron. Um, we records managers need to become people who provide advice and make decisions, not people who do busy work all day long. We tried to get the users to do the busy work and then we tried to take all of the burden ourselves when it became clear that they wouldn't do that. We can't be spending our time reading every document to try to work out how it should classify after the fact. We have machines that can do that now. So the people that we need in records management are people who can look at a big picture, follow the evidence with full transparency down as far as they need to go and then make a recommendation give advice or make a decision who are empowered to do that. I think that's what we'll all become. Well, thank you very much. We've hit 1.30. I, I'd really just like to thank all of the panellists from today. Um, Alyssa, Rachel, Cameron, Abdullah, Andrew, Cass, um, thank you so much for taking the time for this. I, I really appreciate it. I'm sure the audience do as well. Um, we will make this vid the video of this available um, via our YouTube channel and we'll give a copy of it to everybody else who is here on the panel today as well. So I'm sure it'll be out via their YouTube channels or something at some point in the future. Um, I hope I see you all at RIMPA this year. I can buy you all a drink just to really thank you for, uh, thank you for the time you've taken today. Thank you so much. And with that, thank you. we'll call the panel to a close. Thank you, thank you very much everybody for thank coming. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you everyone. Thanks. See you later. Thank you.